Um, so far in Secret Church, we have been studying. How many of you have a notebook? Does, it, does anybody have a notebook? I hope you have a notebook. We are, we are going to great lengths to make sure that you have good notes. And because of that, I think you ought to hold on to them. How many of you go home and put the notes in a notebook? How many of you take them home? I, I hope you do. I hope that you can get back to them. And I, I believe, I really believe that as we study this great issue of uh, heaven, hell, and the end of the world in this secret church, that a lot of questions are going to be answered um, that maybe you've had. And uh, tonight we're going to be looking at some things that are of hot topic um, as we look at the return of Christ. Let's think about this, though. So far we've looked at the, we've looked at the frailty and the finality of life. What were some of the concepts in the frailty of life and the finality of life that we looked at? What, what were we basically saying during those, those, that week, that couple of weeks? What were we looking at? Realities of what? Okay, somebody said reality of dying. And what did we say about that? What's the mortality rate? Okay, you got that. The fact is, nobody makes it out of here alive, right? Um, you go through the portal of death. Um, but Jesus said, if anyone believes in me, what does it say after that? If anyone believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. That's an important thing. That those who are believing in Christ, you are going to go through physical death. But though you die physically, you will live spiritually in him and for eternity and in a greater reality. So we looked at the finality and the frailty, the frailty of life and the finality of death and the fact that after you die, it's over. What were we specifically saying does not, is not the case that is popularly believed after you die? Okay, say it again. Purgatory. Um, anybody want to... Tell me, what, what, what's purgatory all about? What, what is the common belief of the Roman Catholic Church on purgatory? Go ahead. Purgatory, if I remember correctly, is where you're supposed to go off and work off your venial sins. Okay, there you go. It's a, purif- it's a further purification process, they would say. And in addition to your earthly works, in addition to Christ, in addition to other things, when you get to purgatory, you get to go ahead and burn off the rest of the sins, and then eventually you're ready for heaven. But there's another key thing about getting out of purgatory. How else can you get out of purgatory? Oh, people can pray for you. And what else? And give money. Now, for those of us who have been studying the Reformation over the last few years, we looked at the fact that it was the sale of indulgences that was one of the tipping points of a little German monk named, what was his name? Martin Luther. John Tetzel was the salesman. Very good. I uh, heard that, Ivan. I, John Tetzel was the salesman of those, of those indulgences. And as Luther sat there and listened to this, he just simply kept saying, this is unbiblical. Biblical. And not only is it unbiblical, this is simply manipulative. This is simply manipulative to build a kingdom of man instead of building the kingdom of God. And so if you tell people that they're either going to go to hell or they can get out of hell or out of the possibility of going to hell in purgatory by being faithful to the church and by giving money and by doing a few other things, well, then you have their obedience. Let me just remind you that there's many other religions that still are operating on the whole issue of good works. And so if you tell people they got to go door to door, knock on doors and talk to people in that way, and that by them going every Saturday door to door, or they go on their two year mission and they also do their other things and they get married in a certain church in a certain way, you keep talking about all these works. It's the same old thing. It's the same thing as Islam. Islam is saying, Look, you need points. If you want to get to heaven, you got to have points. And the way you get points is by doing these things. Islam says, says the same thing. Um, and so works, 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 works is how we get to heaven. But we know that the Bible clearly teaches throughout the Bible that the hope of heaven is found in Christ alone. And it's found 
in Christ alone, and we, we get Christ by God's grace through faith in Christ and then belief alone. So um, this is the big picture of the gospel, and this is the big picture of, of the finality of death when we die in this life, uh, our physical death, the die is set on where we're going. God has either redeemed us before that point or we are still in our sins. And to die in your sins means that you will be separated from God. That is very clearly what the Bible says. That's what we've been studying. All of your notes at home, hopefully you have those. So tonight, um, as, we, as we are finished with that study of the intermediate state, which means... Um, you die, and then we're waiting on the final return of Christ, we come to the study of the return of Christ. So um, scripture is so clear about this. Um, This is the end of the intermediate state. The intermediate state is done. Uh, When Christ returns, there is no more intermediate state. Um, That is the idea of anyone and everyone who's ever lived, who has died, and waiting on the final judgment of Christ. Here we come to that in this. This is the culmination of all things. This is the apex of all human existence. And in fact, God's great plan um, in making us in the world. So notice here with me on your outline, and I believe it's on the top of page 30, where it says the return of Christ, Wednesday, October the 2nd. And let's look at the passage of scripture there. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 and 28. Look what it says. And this is the key, this is the key passage for the whole evening. So this passage rides with us through the entire evening. Look what it says. And just as it, as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes what? Judgment. judgment. So you're going to die once, and then comes the judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, underline it, will appear a second time. So he came first, then he's going to come again. He will appear for a second time, not to deal with sin, that's what he did the first time, but to save those who are, look what it says, eagerly awaiting for him. This is a beautiful picture of the, of the culmination of everything when Christ comes again. There's, there's some things that we know about the prophecies of Scripture and about the, the telling of what are the things to come, and there's some things that we don't know. Um, and so we want to look, first of all, at the things that we know. The first thing that we know is that Jesus is coming back. There is no question about the fact that the Bible is very, very clear that Jesus is coming back. In fact, this is just a few of the passages that, dis- that, that declare this, and we're going to read just a few of them, but look at Matthew 24, verses 30 through 31. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, that's Jesus, and then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man cl- coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Look at the next passage, Acts 1, 9 through 11. And when he had said these things, as they were... Now, this is just as Jesus is ascending to the Father. He's looking at his disciples, and he says, I'm leaving, the Holy Spirit's coming, go out and tell everybody what I've done. Um, in coming and dying for your sins. And he says, so I'm leaving. And look what it says. And when he had said these things, they were still looking on. He, lift, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into, the heaven, into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, underline it, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, these are just two. There's many of these. Look at the next one. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look what it says. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. So he's saying, I'm, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for your salvation. I'm thankful that Christ is in you. Look at the end of that parenthetical that, uh, statement in the middle. He says, so that 
You are not lacking in any gift, but as you wait for the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ, underline that, as you wait for what? The revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that's why we're called saints. When God forgives someone, he forgives them completely, found guiltless before the holy God. That is only found through the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2. For what is our hope or joy or crown boasting before our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. And Paul is simply saying, we are so grateful for the fruit of God's grace that we see in your salvation. And you are the reason that he came and you're the reason that he's coming back is the picture. Flip the page over. First Thessalonians does, does it a few times. We look down through there. Look at Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy. Look at First Peter. Look at First Peter 1 and verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you, underline this, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? At the revealing of Christ. This is when he comes again. We're looking forward to this final moment. And then I'm going to have you notice something here. In 1 John, it also talks about that. He's coming again. You don't want to shrink back in shame. But look at Revelation 22.7, Revelation 22.12, and Revelation 22.20. And I want you to see three beholds. This is so cool. Look at verse 22 and verse 7. And behold... I am coming soon. Underline those, those words. Behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Look at 22.12. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. And then look at 22.20. Same word, though, used a little bit different in English. He says, who testifies to these things and says, behold, or surely, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. This is, this is so clear throughout the Bible. Jesus wants us to know that he is the God who is present. He is present with us um, through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's present through us through our salvation. And in, even in the Messiah himself, he has gone, come, saved us from our sins, gone back to heaven, sent the Holy Spirit. But the redeeming sacrifice of Christ is coming again to us. And this is just eminently clear throughout the New Testament. These are not the only places where you see it. You see it many other places in the New Testament where there are references to the second coming of Christ or to the return of Christ. But notice these things about that. First one is at the bottom of page 31. His return will be, fill it in, unexpected. His return will be unexpected. Therefore, stay awake. Underline this. For you do not know what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready. We see this emphasis. You don't know, but be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour, underline this, he's coming at an hour that you do not expect. So if somebody declares to you the hour to expect it, what do you immediately know? He's not coming then. So that person just ruined it for us. So, I mean, just kind of know, we do not know when he is coming. Look at Luke chapter 12, verse 30. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming, underline it, at an hour you what? Do not expect. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like what? A thief in the night. You don't know. Look at 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved in the earth, and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Very interesting. So it's all going to be revealed at that point when it's said and done. So the first one is his return will be unexpected. The second thing is his return will be visible. Um, we already saw this in the passage that said that the, the angels are sitting there looking at the disciples saying, men of Galilee, he is going to come back just like he left. 
Now, how do you go? He went up. He lifted up bodily in front of them. It's not like he dissolves like, what are the Star Trek transporters? Don't you wish you could use a Star Trek transporter to go across the world? That would be so much easier. Um, beam me up, Scotty. That's right. Um, beam me up, Lord. You've seen that in bumper, bumper stickers. Yeah. But Jesus is not just going to like suddenly appear like a transporter. It says that he's going to come back physically from the heavens, and it's going to be visible. Look at Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And when he had said these things, and they were looking on, he lifted up, and the cloud took him out of their sight. And so that's the same thing. Look at the bottom line, uh, or the bottom part of that. This Jesus who was taken up for you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So it's very specific about that. It's going to be visible. Look at Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds in every I will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wait on account of him, even so, amen. So this picture is, it's going to be visible and all will see. So he will, his return will be visible. So not only unexpected and visible, it will also be personal. He is going to come back personally, in person. And I want you to see this in John 14, one through three. Let not your hearts be troubled, Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? The answer to that is no. Um, I, I'm going to prepare a place. Why would I have said that? He said, he doesn't say anything that's untrue. Look at the last part. And if I go and prepare a place for you, underline it, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. All of that is very, very personal. Jesus wants to be with us. Jesus wants us to be with him. This is about the personhood of Christ. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet what? We're going to meet the Lord in the air. So he's going to be there personally. And so we will always be with the Lord. I love that. I love that. So we will always be with the Lord. It's personal. But look at the next one there. Not only unexpected, and visible and personal, his return will be, and this is great, his return will be glorious. Absolutely glorious. Look at Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. When the Son of Man comes, underline it, in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit, underline it, on his what? Glorious throne. So this is all about the unveiled glory of Christ. When Christ came the first time, he was somewhat veiled. I mean, he comes veiled as a baby. He comes veiled in human flesh. He comes veiled as a son of an earthly father and mother. I mean, that's, that's how it seems. So there's this veiling of this. So we start to realize that through what he says and through what he does, that this Messiah that is to be expected is actually God in person in the form of a man. So that, fill this in. He came the first time lying in a manger. He will come the second time riding on the clouds. He came the first time very quietly. Um, now there were angels out in the, out in the uh, excuse me, shepherds out in the, the hillside. And, and suddenly a myriad of angels stands before them and says, Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth with whom God is well pleased. And we see this beautiful picture of a glorious announcement. But for the most people, it was a very quiet time. Look at Psalm 104, verse 3. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. That's the language in which we see the Son of Man coming the second time. Look at Isaiah 19.1. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt, and the idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. We see this language of the way God rides over 
the earth and rides over with his sovereign power. Look at Matthew 24, verse 30. Then will appear in the heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power, look at that, with power in great glory. And what's interesting about this is that how did Jesus not only come, he, he came as a baby lying in a manger, and th- that's how he came into Bethlehem. How did he come into Jerusalem the week before he would? He comes on a, and it's not just a donkey, a young donkey, a foal donkey. So this is a weak, this isn't even a donkey that is very valuable for work yet. So this is, a, this is really humility. This is really meekness. My friends, it's going to be all the opposite the second time that he comes. It's going to be in great and grand declaration of his glory. Um, look at this next part here. He came the first time in humility to provide salvation. He will come the second time in glory to execute judgment. Now, when it says that he's coming the second time to receive and to save his own, the picture is, is that, yes, indeed, we are saved in Christ before that through the salvation of Christ, but he's coming to even take us out, those who remain, um, from a sinful and fallen world. Look at Matthew 25, 32 and 33. It says, Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Okay, so all of these things that we've just been, his glorious uh, return, his unexpected return, his visible return, these are what we know. These are agreed upon by everyone in every sect practically of Christianity. Anyone who studies the Bible would say these things are clear. He's coming back. It's going to be obvious. It's going to be unexpected. It's going to be glorious. These things we say. But there are some things, look at this next section, that we don't necessarily know. Um, we have parts of it, but not all of it. And what's interesting is these are what we call those secondary doctrines or those tertiary issues. The tertiary issues are the issues that we would say, well, I know that there's some who believe this and there's some who believe this and both are good scholars who are faithful to the Bible. Both are good scholars who are faithful to the word of God. Um, Some of these things, there's reason for us not knowing exactly the details on this. And this is quite honestly where um, a fair amount of Christians get pretty distracted. There are a fair amount of Christians that become very, very dogmatic with a particular, a particular grid through which they interpret all of Scripture. And we just have to be careful about that. Um, there are some things that we can be very dogmatic about that are very, very clear. Salvation in Christ alone, that's very clear. Um, Christ is the only way. Jesus, I mean, the, the fact that the Holy Spirit has come for all believers, that is very, very clear. I mean, there, there's a lot of issues that are quite clear. But when it comes to some of these things, and because they're somewhat, I'm going to say this, they're somewhat sensational. I mean, it's, it's how is this going to play out? And I, and I want to know. You know, human beings love to know the future. Do you know what is spent on trying to forecast the weather? (laughs) I mean, it is hysterical what is spent on trying to forecast the weather. And there are a few things that they know what is going to happen with the weather. There are some things that they can get it right almost every single time. But there are other other things about atmospheric conditions that they don't know what it's going to do. And there's a fair amount of time when all the models have the thing, you know, going in circles and going over and then back and then around. And, you know, they, they don't really know until it's almost happening. Well, that's kind of how it is with some of the end time issues. You know, if you, if you see people out in the world that are um, really fearful or they're they're really desirous to make money or they're really doing this, a lot of times they will go to a medium or they will go to someone trying to get um, a a hint of the future. They're trying to see it. And they'll pay money for somebody with a crystal ball 
They'll pay money for somebody that can supposedly tell them. What's really funny about that is it's, it's a demonic joke in this. I mean, the demons are involved. There's no doubt about it. And there are things that are said. There's no doubt about it. And some things, they even sound like the truth. But it's really funny. One of the things that I've noticed over and over and over again, as I've ever heard people talk about this or stories about this or whatever, the reality of mediums and the reality of sorcery in this way of trying to tell the truth, I mean, excuse me, trying to tell the future is that they can give hints about the present that make you think that they're accurate. Like they'll say things about your life or whatever that through some type of demonic way they know about you. But a demon does not know the future. There is no demon that knows the future. Um, Only God truly knows the future and he has it all worked out. Um, demons can make it sound, they can make uh, a medium sound like they're speaking truth about the future, um, but that's only from things from the present or the past. They do not know the future. And so here we come to see some things that um, we, we start to realize you have to be careful what all you're saying about the future. The first big thing that we would say is um, that we do not know is when Jesus is coming back. We do not know that. We've already read several passages. Here's another one, Mark 13. Look what it says. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, there's a whole discussion to have there about the Trinity, and we'll have that at another time. But I I just want you to see this. Look what it says. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. That is really one of the main things Christians need to hear from these words about the coming of Christ, is that you do not know and you are called to be ready. Look at Matthew 25 and verse 13. Watch therefore, for you do not know neither the day nor the hour. Now, I'm reminded of, how about this? Um, Does anybody remember the book 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. (laughs) That was like a bestseller. And I'm embarrassed to say among Christians that was a bestseller. 88 reasons why, why Jesus is coming back in 1988. How about this one? Some of you maybe have heard of Harold Camping. Do you guys remember the guy, the radio guy, Harold Camping? He said, Jesus is coming back on May 21st, 2011. And when Jesus didn't come back, he said, oops, sorry, wrong calculation. It's October 21st, 2011. And when he didn't come back again, Harold Camping was like, okay, I'm done. I think everybody else was like, you just need to be quiet. Um, But it was amazing that so much buzz was created by that. And there were, there were even Christians. I mean, I, I remember um, there were people that were, what do you think? What do you think about this? Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that no one knows the day or the hour when Jesus is coming back. And so notice here, not only do we not know the, when Jesus is coming back, we don't really know what signs have been fulfilled. We do not know what signs have been fulfilled. Um, Let me give you some examples of this. The preaching of the gospel to all nations. Um, The Bible tells us that Jesus will come back after the gospel has been proclaimed to all nations. Now, there were some who would say at the end of the first century, the gospel had been preached to all of what was called the civilized world at that time, all the ethnos. Um, There would be some who would say, well, now we are preaching the gospel to every nation on the earth through satellite and people present. There are missionaries in literally every country on the earth. So the gospel has been fulfilled in this. Um, There's others who, more along my thinking, is is that no, when we're talking about the nations, when we're talking about the different ethnos, the different tribes, there are still tribes of people um, all over the place who have never yet heard the gospel. And those are groups that are legitimately called ethnos or the nations of the world, the peoples of the world. 
Um, we still have, in fact, a few thousand people groups that have not heard the gospel, that do not have the gospel in their language. And so there's, but there's question there. So when is, when is Mark, Mark 13 verse 10 going to be? Look at Mark 13 verse 10. It's the end there where it says, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. That's clearly, that means something here about the gospel being proclaimed around the world and among all peoples. So, and then the end will come. That's an important part. Look at Matthew 24, verse 14. And the gospel of this kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and underline it, then the end will come. So since the, the end hasn't come yet, I'm assuming the gospel hasn't been preached to all the nations, that we're still in the process of that. Not only what does it mean for the preaching of the gospel to all nations, but here's another one that we, we don't know a lot about the Great Tribulation. Um, has the Great Tribulation already occurred? Um, was it at the end, um, excuse me, was it at the beginning um, of the life of the church? Was it after, enduring? There, let me tell you that if you were alive in Rome in 155 AD, just 155, really about 120 years after Jesus had been crucified for our sins, you would be thinking, this is the great tribulation. I mean, Christians were being drawn and quartered, burned, mulched, you name it, it was happening to them. Um, that you, you could say that, that that certainly must have been the great tribulation. There were other times, let me tell you, if you were a, alive during the Reformation and you were a Protestant Christian during the Reformation, your, your friends were being carted off and killed by either secular powers or by the Roman Catholic Church. There were many, many Christians that were burned at the stake. They were thrown in prisons. They were chased down. You talk about persecution. There was great persecution against the Huguenots in the south of France. It's, it's, it's not really... Um, uh, there's other areas of the, of the Protestant Reformation that are talked about a lot. You don't hear a lot about the French Huguenots in part because it was in French and people didn't translate the history to English and everything else for a long time. But the fact of the matter is that there were thousands upon thousands of Christians that were murdered in southern France because of their faith in Jesus. If, if you were there, you would have thought that. Um, was certainly a time of great tribulation. Notice what it says in Mark chapter 13, verse 7 and 8. And when you hear of wars and rumor of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. The end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but, but the beginning of birth pangs. Look at Mark 13. For in those days there will be such tribulation that the earth has not that has not been since the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord has not cut if the Lord had not cut short the days no human being would be saved, but for the sake of the elect whom he chose he shortened the days. Now, I mean there's a fair amount of statements like this that we go, what does that exactly mean? It could be this or it could be that. And um, there are good and reliable scholars um, on different sides that would say um, various things about that. But it's safe to say that we know that there's going to be great persecution until Christ returns, and especially leading up to immediately before he returns. That is very safe to say. Um, and we see that in Matthew chapter 24. Again, so when you see the abomination of desolation. Now, a lot of people thought that was when Titus... Um, sacrificed pigs on the altar in Jerusalem in 70 AD and then destroyed the temple. There was a lot of people who thought this has got to be the abomination of desolation. Um, notice here, spoken of by Daniel, standing in the holy place. Uh, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for the women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days... Um, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now. Um, so you, you see this talk of a very, very radical and true tribulation. So 
What does it really mean about the proclamation of the gospel of all nations? What does it really mean about the, the great tribulation? We don't really know what it also means, bottom of page 34, about false prophets and miracle workers. Are, the, are these very, very general statements? I mean, we've got a lot of false prophets now um, of many, many different kinds that are proclaiming the gospel for different. We've looked at that, um, and those, those seem to be multiplying um, right now. There's no doubt about that. And even miracle workers, people who seem to be miracle workers, this is saying perhaps even real miracle workers, not talking about Benny Hinn, that's sham stuff. Um, but what about demonic power workers? There will be magical power workers. That's, that's very possible, very probable um, in this. And this is, I believe, what it's speaking of. Look at Mark chapter 13 and verse 22. Look what it says at the top of page 35. For false Christ, and underline it, false prophets will arise, and look what it says, and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all these things, or all things, beforehand. Christians in this day and time need to recognize, and Sheridan Hills needs to recognize, if, things, if we are getting near the end and things are going to heat up, persecution will come, and there will be mass deception, and there will be powerful prophets, and there will be people doing stuff right in front of your very eyes that will appear to you. And some people will say, well, if they can do this, they must be part of the truth and I need to follow this or I need to believe this or I need to do whatever it is that they're calling me to do but those are false prophets that are leading us away from Christ and so powerful and convincing that some even Christians will be tempted to be led away look at Matthew 24 verse 23 we see the other idea of this then if anyone says to you look here is the Christ or there he is do not believe it. For false Christ and pro false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So these are false prophets and false miracle workers that the Bible says are going to come. We don't know much about. We know that those have existed to some degree ever since Jesus left. I mean, there were, there were multiple people in ancient Israel that said that they were the Messiah, both before Christ and after Christ. And there were people who followed them. Um, and we're called to recognize that that um, is, a, is a temptation um, for some. Look at the next part here. Signs in the heavens. What does it mean that there's going to be signs in the heavens? When you look at the Mark 13, 24. But in those days after the tri tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So there's something that is going to happen that is going to precede the coming of Christ that seems to be on a celestial sta uh, scale. Now, some people would say, well, when there have been great um, um, events that have clouded the sun from shining, maybe a huge, massive super volcano that would cloud the sun from shining. Maybe uh, there, there were people that were saying, this well could have been from the first Gulf War. Remember after, in the first Gulf War when all of the oil wells were blown up and all of the oil lines and, and the oil was coming out of the ground and burning and it created a, a covering in the Middle East of, of clouds that caused it to be very, very dark over thousands and thousands and thousands of square miles. There were some people that were saying, Christian prophet-minded people that were saying, this is a, a covering over the land of Israel that comes from all of this war uh, thing that is clouding the heavens and the sky is darkened in the, in the bright of day uh, and the moon does not give its light because of this and this is part of that prophecy. Um, I, I don't think so. I think that it means something different than oil wells burning nearby to Israel. 
Um, so you just you start to see that there's different things that people have, have always tried to pin these things as saying what they are when the fact of the matter is we're not sure exactly what that means. Look at Matthew twenty four twenty nine. It says in the middle of that, that one, it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Um, and this will appear in the heavens as a sign of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds um, in heaven in power and great glory. So again, a celestial type uh, uh, things that we're not sure exactly what that means. Is it literal? Is it figurative? Will it be complete all the way around the world? Or will it be segmented? We don't know that. Um, we know it's going to be significant, though. Look at the next one here, middle of page, or the, toward the bottom of page 35. Not only the signs in the heavens, but also the coming of the Antichrist. Do we know what this means? Do we know exactly what this is the picture of? Um, now notice this, and we, we, we often hear a lot of talk about what is the Antichrist, and um, what we do know is that there's going to spirit, be a spirit of great lawlessness. Think about this with me. Um, the early church has always been trying to name the Antichrist, or excuse me, the church in general has always been trying to name the Antichrist. There were many in the early church who were under the persecution of Rome and who would they be saying is the Antichrist? Nero. Say it again. Nero, Nero or Claudius or um, Dominus or one of the other Caesars that was bringing great persecution upon the church. There were many Caesars over a period of 250 years that persecuted the church heavily. So the the leader the current leader of rome was often called the antichrist um eventually there were others that would have come along but somebody also said the pope the pope has often been called the antichrist he is a powerful leader who um anyone who really reads the bible would say he's not in tune with what the bible says and you know the pope that we have now um, seems to be rather innocuous. Excuse me, all the popes that we've had for the last 150 or 200 years have been rather innocuous. They haven't been very violent and dangerous. They haven't been leading holy wars, and they haven't been putting many people to death. Um, they run around in a pope mobile and wave and, you know, all those nice things that they do. Um, but that wasn't always the case. I mean, there were popes that saw themselves as great warriors, and there were popes that led... Uh, all kinds of inquisitions and all kinds of great um, uh, attack upon the early church. So it would be very reasonable that many people would say, well, this must be the Antichrist. Um, how about this one? During the great uh, Cold War, there were many people who were saying, well, what must be the Antichrist is actually the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union has been expanding. The Soviet Union is this dark power. I mean, if, if during the 1950s and the 1960s, and when we were seeming to come to uh, the, on the brink of nuclear war, how many of you remember the Bay of Pigs? I mean, some of you are saying, okay, what is the Bay of Pigs? Um, and some of you are saying, I'm afraid to put my hand up because it'll show my age. It doesn't matter. We respect age here. So who cares how old you are? Um, you, uh, that's, that doesn't matter. But if you were alive during the Cold War, and especially when it was potentially getting hot, turning from a Cold War to a hot war, you would say, man, the Soviet Union must be the Antichrist. Already in the last couple of years, since all of the technology stuff and all of the social credit stuff and all of the rising of China, I've heard people say, well, China could be a figurative antichrist. They are atheistic. They are against um, Christianity. They are now rising in great power. They have surveillance ability that the world has never known, which is all true. Um, and so there's, there's some who have said, well, certainly China, especially if it comes to inflict um, great pressure upon the church, that certainly could be the antichrist. So the question is, is it a specific person? Is it a figurative person? Is it a nation? Is it a system? Um, 
those are, those are all things that I personally believe that it's going to be an individual. I, I believe it will be an individual that's very powerful. I believe that there have been many evil individuals that have come along, but eventually there's going to be a demonic person that is raised up um, that is going to be a very powerful one who will deceive. Um, look at Second Thessalonians um, and this passage, I, I want you to see, it starts, at the, no, it starts at the bottom of 35, and then it goes over to 36. And uh, I want you to see this. Look what it says. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, do not be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or letters seeming to be from us to the, ele- to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness, underline that, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? You know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only be, look what it says, Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus Christ will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Now, I realize that everything we've been talking about tonight, especially when we come to things like this, I mean, this is getting deep into rather enormous sensational aspects, and sensational I mean by playing on our senses, overwhelming prophecies of things that are going to come, and they don't sound good. But we have to remember all of the promises that Jesus has made to us about these things. And we're going to see that in just a minute um, in clearer view. But look at this. We, We can take heart in this statement that is here underneath that. The Spirit of Christ is on Christians as a guarantee of his future coming. It's, it's the, the Holy Spirit that comes and has been given to us to guarantee and to hold us and to seal us for that day. Look what it says in Romans 8, 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of what? This does it say. Our souls? Does it say our souls? No, our bodies. It's saying that even our bodies are going to be redeemed. He's going to come, and all those who have died before us, and if we die, our body too, he's going to come, and he's going to redeem our bodies. And if you're alive, he, he will bodily um, redeem you out of this. Um, that's, a, that's a wonderful promise that even our bodies he is going to redeem. Look at Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of the salvation, believed in him, were sealed, underline that, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the, pos- the possession of it. And so that's saying until all things are finished and we are finally with the Lord, both in body and in spirit, um, these, are the, these are the promises. So, Christians, in light of these, these massive, powerful predictions and forecast of the great cataclysmic struggle um, before Christ returns, Christians can take heart um, that we have been guaranteed his coming. Look at the next part here. The spirit of the Antichrist in, in the world is also as a guarantee of his future coming. 
the picture is things are, things are lawless and becoming more laws, lawless as an indication that he's coming again. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world, look what it says, already. So while I do believe that the Antichrist will be an individual, that's my belief, I do believe that there is a spirit of Antichrist, that there is a spirit that is against Christ in unbelief that seeks to exalt self and exalt this world um, and not worship God. Um, So the spirit of Antichrist in the world just is a proof that he is coming again. Look at the next statement here. The Christ was preceded and accompanied. So the Christ, that means the Messiah. The Christ was preceded and accompanied by a true prophet. Who was the true prophet that preceded Christ? John the Baptist Baptist was the forerunner of the Christ. He was the forerunner saying, clear the way, make way in the wilderness. Here is the Messiah. Look what he says. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the idea is get out of the way, let him come through straight. He doesn't have to walk around you, doesn't have to go around you. It is saying, here is the Lord. Think about it. When a king would show up into a crowded place um, and maybe by surprise to the, to the village or by surprise to the city, what would, what would the guys do that are out in front of the king? Make way! Right? And they would, they would clear out the path, and the king would come walking through. That is the picture here. That is the picture of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was saying, the king is here. Um, he's coming. Notice here with me as well. The, the Antichrist will be preceded and accompanied by a false prophet. So there's clear indication that if the Antichrist is indeed an individual, and I believe so, Um, there will be a false prophet that is in league with him, and these two will play together in this. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, Children, it is the last hour. As you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come, therefore we know that it is the last hour. Now that was written 2,000 years ago, and the idea is we're in the final epic before Jesus comes back. Now we happen to have been in that time for 2,000 years. Um, I think it's good that Christians in every age, I think true Christians in every age have said, Jesus is coming. He's coming soon. That's a safe place to be. You don't need to go, ah, it's been 2,000 years. The early Christians thought that. The middle-aged Christians thought that. The Christians before Mikhail Gorbachev came, they thought that was the Antichrist himself with the splotch on his head, you know, whatever. You know, the, you know, the, the picture is Christians should always believe that the Antichrist is coming and that we are prepared. Um, Skip the page there and flip over and notice here with me. The Christ speaks truth. When Jesus comes, he always speaks truth. When he came to the earth the first time, he speaks truth. The Antichrist spreads deception. That is that just like Jesus spoke the truth and nothing but the truth, The Antichrist will always deceive, and he will deceive, sometimes sounding true, but ultimately being false. Look at John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. In fact, let's read out loud tonight, John 8, 31 through 32. Let's all read it together. Let's see what it says. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So Jesus is saying, it, it, you've heard me speak the truth, and if you abide in my words, you're going to walk in the truth. But look at the deception of the Antichrist. John, this is Second John and verse 7. It says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one 
is the deceiver and the antichrist. And so this is the idea of a deceiver that is going to come and is going to deny the very reality of Christ coming. In Revelation 13, 13 and 14, we get the idea, and, and some would say this, the first beast spoken of in Revelation 13 is talking about the Antichrist himself, and the second beast talked about in Revelation 13 is the false prophet that says, look at what he said, and, and seeking to verify what the Antichrist has said. So kind of a voice of affirmation of the Antichrist. So these two seem to appear in Revelation 13. But notice in Revelation 13, verse 13, it says, It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And so the idea is these fantastic things that are going to seem to be um, so phenomenal that people are are going to believe um, because of this, but yet it will all the while deny the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ himself. So notice this, and as we finish with this tonight, the Christ builds the temple, that is the church, this is the dwelling place of God, of which he is the cornerstone. And we, we see that this is what Jesus does. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus, underline this, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. That's by which the whole building is held together. In whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in, in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into, look what it says, a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So this is who Christ is. He's the cornerstone. He is that which sets all of the structure of God where God dwells within us. It's just amazing. Christ in us. God is, is glorified by being in the church, the church being his temple. But notice what the Antichrist is going to do. The Antichrist stands in the temple claiming to be its center. And that is a massive difference um, between these two. Look what Second Thessalonians 3 says. It says, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, and the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes, look at this, He takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. This is Satan's last attempt to be God. This is, doesn't this go back to the Garden of Eden? When you read his deception of Eve, Adam and Eve, he's, he's making these claims there too. The Bible fits together like lock and key, by the way. I hope you're gaining a, a, a great reverence for that, a great uh, awe of how the message of the Bible and God's whole narrative is completely unified. Um, here we are talking about the very last things, and it points right back to the Garden of Eden. Make no mistake about it. Um, Christians who are eagerly awaiting for the Lord have absolutely nothing to fear. Um, Can you go back to the very first page? Look at the very first page. I had you circle, I think, that text at the top. And I think Alex has it on the screen. Look what it says. And just as it is appointed... For man to die once, and for that, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with this, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for Him. Now, here's what we need to be: we need to be those who are eagerly waiting for Him. That's the safe place for you to be. 
The safe person for you to be is saying, I, I am waiting for his coming. I cannot wait for him to return. I am looking, and I know it may even be described as horrifically difficult before he comes again. But he has made a promise that he is going to come again and redeem us out of all our troubles. I'm just going to tell you something that happened. And if, I don't know if TJ's in here or he went back. I can't see when, the, when I'm here. But yeah, he's sitting right there. Okay, so TJ, when I was a freshman in college, I didn't go to a Christian school. I went to Florida State University. And Florida State was just, it was rough, tumble, whatever. Party school, everything else. And I remember I, I had um, a roommate. And I had put on my forms for the dorm housing that I was a Christian. I was an evangelical Christian. And um, I apparently, it was either this or the Holy Spirit just really did a miracle in this. My roommate was an evangelical Christian. Um, and so I was, at first, I was not sure if he was really a Christian. I, I was kind of getting to know him a little bit. And he was very, very quiet. And um, he would, he kind of talk like this most of the time. And I, I would say, well, how you doing, John? I'm doing all right. And, you know, we'd talk. I couldn't get him to say much. And so we went to, you know, breakfast. We went to lunch. And, and he already had two or three friends, four or five friends. And they were kind of, it was like at rush week for uh, the, the fraternities. And so some of them kind of got to know each other. And I had one or two friends. But I just walked with him down to the big cafeteria and we walked in the cafeteria and there was a like five or six seven guys sitting down there and somebody said hey come on over and so john and i go walking over there and as we went walking up to the table one of the guys cursed saying jesus christ and john just goes where <laughs> where what are you talking about and it, in the cafeteria he stood up where <laughs> literally true and I'm just going, oh my gosh. <laughs> he said, I've been waiting on him. <laughs> and then he said, don't ever use the name of Christ again in vain. I just kind of rebuked the guy. And everybody was kind of like, whoa. <laughs> John's a cool guy. He's a school principal now. Great guy. But... <laughs> I no longer wondered if he was a Christian, <laughs> and I no longer wondered um, how dramatic he could be. Um, so I, I always think, when I read passages like this, eagerly awaiting Jesus, I just think about the zeal that we're called to have. And maybe like John, being a bold witness, making a point, loving on the Lord.